The invasion in 2003 was supposed to remove an oppressive dictator and replace him with a stable democracy. 13 years on, Iraq is a country fragmenting, consumed by violence and run by sectarian militias. This is the story of how that came about. Baghdad in flames at night. Not shock and awe 2003, but July 2016, last weekend. Islamic State bombs a busy shopping area. 250 people are dead. Chilcott speaks of an intervention that went badly wrong, with consequences to this day. In Baghdad this evening, at the site of the explosion, people gave their reaction. When the British Army went into Basra, they were welcomed. In the overwhelmingly Shia South, the removal of Saddam Hussein, who'd always favored the Sunni minority, felt like a liberation. But in the vacuum left behind by debathification, the full-scale dismantling of the Iraqi state, Shia clerics like Muqtada al-Sadr built large followings and powerful militias. Backed by Iran, they began to cause trouble for the British military. In September 2005, two men were stopped at a police checkpoint on the outskirts of Basra. They were SAS operatives dressed as Iraqi civilians. When they flashed their military IDs, there was a confrontation. They opened fire, killing an Iraqi officer. One of the men was Colin McLachlan. He told Newsnight how he and his comrade were dragged from their car. We were taken into an outhouse at the side of the checkpoint. Slowly but surely, they um, removed our clothes, body armor, weapons, um, mock executions, light beatings, um, interrogation. And then um, a chief police officer came in with his red lapels, told us it was mistaken identity and they were going to take us back to the palace, um, loaded us into four or five police four by fours. And on the way back into where the palace was, they took uh, a left instead of a right and went into the police station and took us in there. The police had been infiltrated by the militia. The British military, powerless to get the men released, stormed the police station. In the aftermath, angry crowds surrounded a British armoured personnel carrier. These images shocked a nation that thought it was winning hearts and minds. As Chilcot identified, the militia, not the British army, had become the dominant force in Basra. This event was a turning point, certainly in the public perception of Britain's role in Basra. It was the point at which many people realised that softly, softly, simply wasn't working. And in the ensuing battle between the British military and the Iranian-backed Shia militias, it was the militias that would eventually prevail. Two years later, the Brits cut a deal with the militia to pull back from the city. It was, in effect, a surrender. Chilcot called it humiliating. From then until their official withdrawal from Iraq, the British Army was, in effect, confined to barracks at its compound near the airport. As Chilcot makes clear, American planning for the post-invasion phase was similarly inadequate. They faced an insurgency in the West, led by a coalition of Al-Qaeda and Sunni tribes that soon spread to other parts of Iraq. In 2006, a massive bombing in Samarra at one of the holiest Shia shrines sparked a sectarian civil war. By the summer of that year, a hundred people were being murdered every day. I got back to Iraq at the beginning of 2007 and every morning there'd be dead bodies found in the street. 
and you could tell what sect they were by the way they'd been murdered, whether they'd been drilled through the head or whether there was a bullet there. There were so many dead bodies in the river, washed up, that people stopped eating fish. They said the fish started to taste differently because they'd just been living off bodies. Then came the surge. The United States deployed an extra 30,000 soldiers. Sunni tribes joined the Americans in the fight against Al-Qaeda. It worked. US troop deaths declined, so too did civilian killings. Emma Skye witnessed it firsthand as aide to General Ray Odierno, America's top commander in Iraq. I really felt, and everybody really felt, that the war had been won. And by 2009, the violence in Iraq had dropped dramatically. And everybody in Iraq thought the civil war was behind them. Iraqis had changed their strategic calculus. It wasn't that all the bad guys had been killed, but they actually decided that they could achieve what they wanted through politics rather than through violence. But in the end, it was politics that was to be Iraq's undoing. In March 2010, there were parliamentary elections. The results were close. The Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, and his coalition of Shia parties won two seats fewer than a secular coalition which had garnered support from the Sunni community. Neither had enough seats to govern on their own. Iran saw its chance and seized the initiative. Behind the scenes, the Americans were trying to negotiate a way out of the political deadlock, but so too were the Iranians. And it was eventually Iran who managed to broker a deal that would see Nouri al-Maliki, their favored candidate, keep the presidency. In return, Maliki would demand a complete withdrawal of American forces. So Maliki got his second term thanks to the Iranians. When he was secure in his seat for the second term, the first thing he did was go after the Sunni politicians. He accused them of terrorism and drove them out of the political process. He reneged on promises that he had made to the Sunni tribes, the Sunni awakening, that had fought against Al-Qaeda in Iraq with the support of the US forces. And he arrested Sunnis en masse. And in such an environment, the Islamic State was able to rise up out of the ashes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and present itself as a defender of the Sunnis against the Iranian-backed sectarian regime of Nouri al-Maliki. Today, Islamic State is in retreat pushed out of cities like Fallujah by a coalition of Iraqi military, Shia militias, and Sunni fighters who have again turned against the jihadists. They're backed by US and British air power, but on the ground, it is the divisive Shia militias that hold sway. In the battle-scarred towns of Anbar, Sunni civilians are subjected to revenge attacks. And as the bombings last weekend showed, Islamic State's capacity to kill remains undimmed. As the Americans withdrew the last of their troops in 2011, one man told me, Iraq is becoming a place where other countries come to settle their scores. Nearly five years later, that is exactly what has come to pass. <laughs>